Hi, everyone. Welcoming, welcome to uh, Deliver Health with Dignity. We have a great panel. This is one of the ones, you know, we've been planning this for months. This was one of the ones we were most excited about, particularly because of the five people we have up here. Um, my name is Katie Drasser. I'm the Deputy Director for Global Health and Development here at the Institute. And it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Liz Ogbu, the moderator for this session. Um, there's a, something happening right now in human-centered design, and that is that there's a whole group, sorry, I just ran across from introducing the other one <laughs> in the altitude. Um, there's a whole movement right now in human-centered design, and what's really cool about it is it's mostly women who are pioneering it, and Liz is certainly at the center of that. And many of the other women who are also pioneering it are here uh, on this campus somewhere. But for Liz, she was, one of, she was in the first class of IDEO.org fellows, which was really, really competitive. Um, and she has spun off to create her own company now called Studio O, but she's worked all over the world with some of the most brilliant minds, and she herself is just energetic and brilliant, and we're so happy you're here, so thank you. Thank you, Katie, for that great introduction. I did not pay her to do that, by the way. Um, so I'm really excited to be here and with this great panel. I think we're gonna have a really interesting conversation, and I hope that you guys are also prepared to be engaged in the conversation. And um, by way of previewing that, I think it would be helpful for us and hopefully all of you to just know who's in the room. So it would be great if just like by a show of hands, we get how many of you work for nonprofit healthcare service providers? Um, how many of you work for for-profit healthcare service providers? Um, how many of you work for nonprofits that are allied with health, either water, education, et cetera? For-profits who fit into that? Um, and how many of you are consultants around policy or any related issue? Great. Is there anything I didn't call out? That's med school students. <laughs> Great, well it sounds like we have a pretty diverse group, which I think will be a great fodder for this conversation, which is really about how do you deliver healthcare with dignity, but I think talking about it from different perspectives, which my panelists represent. Uh, before I turn it over to them, the other thing I wanted to do is I thought it was really interesting, this question of dignity. Uh, it seems to me it's one of those words, sort of like high quality care that we toss out, but we don't necessarily have what, is, what exactly does that mean? Uh, I was at a diversity workshop last week where we were talking about the power of words to really communicate things and to really talk about things with intent. So I just did a quick look up of what dignity means and the sort of standard definition is that it is the state or quality of being worthy of honor or respect. And after a little bit of further probing, I found um, psychologist Donna Hicks who actually questioned the respect part of that. Uh, she said that respect is actually something that is earned, but that when we talk about dignity, it should be something that is about inherent value and worth of human beings, and the idea that we are all born with that. Uh, and so I think that's a really interesting point at which to start this conversation. And so I've asked each of the panelists to tell us a little bit about their organizations, but with a particular frame around how are they addressing these issues of dignity, particularly because we think of healthcare providing happening at a systems level, and dignity is very much about the individual human being. So we will start with Brent. I'm Brent James. I'm a Chief Quality Officer at Intermountain Healthcare in Salt Lake City, not-for-profit system that actually behaves like a not-for-profit. Uh, 22 hospitals, just under 200 clinics, um, oh, 50, 60% of all care delivery in the region, integrated health plan. Um, I had a couple of ideas. We discussed this on the phone and just some framing issues. You know, we've just gone through a major national debate about access to health care through insurance, mostly the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. The one thing that I was disappointed wasn't included in that debate was a, a frank discussion about the aims of health care delivery. There was an assumption that health care delivery was all about health. It turns out there are at least two other potential aims. Perhaps the most important, though, um, I found a great quote that gets to the heart of it. This is from a fellow named Zalagi, uh, published in 1965, at the end of his career, He's, he titled it In Defense of the Art of Medicine, but to Dr. Zalagi, the art of medicine was exactly the clinician-patient relationship. Um, and this is what he said. He said, a man stricken with disease today is assaulted by the same fears and finds himself searching for the same helping hand as his ancestors did five or 10,000 years ago. Oh, he's been told about the clever tools of modern medicine, and somewhat vaguely, he expects that by and by he will probably profit by them. But in his hour of trial, his desperate want 
is for someone who is personally committed to him, who has taken up his cause, who is willing to go to trouble for him. It turns out that the healing professions have been central to human society as long as there have been human beings on the planet, so far as we can tell. And for the vast majority of that time, we could not change a patient's clinical outcome. If you went to see a typical physician, your chance of survival probably went down. We're called the caring professions for a reason. So as another little bit of a framing background, some years ago, we did uh, some fairly good internal research, actually. We asked patients what they wanted in detail, in a careful, scientific way. Um, the number one thing was the relationship with the caring clinician, practitioner. And we broke it out. These are the patient's words. The first thing they said was attentiveness. Did we pay attention? Um, my word for it is relationship. But their word was attentiveness. Did we listen well? Uh, did we respond to their emotional needs as well as their health care needs? Number two is pure information transfer. Did we explain the nature of the circumstance, the various diagnostic and therapeutic options that were available or likely outcomes of each? My word for that is trust. Turns out it relates directly to trust in a very strong way. Number three, their word was shared decision making. My word for it was control. People want to be in control of their own future, as Don Berwick says, nothing about me without me, you see. And finally, their word was dignity and respect. And by that, I mean respect for their time, uh, respect for their cultural background, respect for their opinions and desires in the direction that they want to go. Um, and I thought I'd just frame with that. Um, we'll come back and talk about the Intermountain System and how we've tried to implement those a little bit later, I thought. But um, thank you, Liz. Rushika. Great. So my name is Rushika Fernando Pule. I'm a primary care doctor. Uh, and I am co-founder and CEO of a little company. We are a for-profit that acts like a not-for-profit who um, is trying to recreate the model of primary care. And I think, uh, unfortunately, in healthcare, as you said, for thousands of years as doctors, as healers in general, our job has been to um, work with patients and, be, and, and help them through things. And we've gotten enamored over the last 50 years of our technology, the billing, the coding, the huge obscene amounts of money going through healthcare. We've turned healthcare into a series of transactions. And we've forgotten, I think, the core premise, which is our job is to meet the needs of our patients. And it's really funny, in any other industry, if you said your job is to meet the needs of your customers, you'd say, no, duh. But it's actually deeply heretical in healthcare. And I, let me tell you a quick story that I think illustrates it. And this is a, pa I got a call one morning from a patient, actually a patient's husband, and here's the story. He, he woke up at night and his bed was shaking. And his wife next to him, who was in her 30s, reasonably healthy, um, they had a couple kids, was having a grand mal seizure. If you've never seen a grand mal seizure before, it's petrifying, like you're shaking your limbs, your eyes are rolling backwards. And so he calls 911, uh, the EMTs arrive, by that time the seizure's over, they put an IV in her um, and they take her to the local ER at a good local hospital. So, you know, they scan her head, don't find anything, do some blood tests, don't find anything, give her a gram of Dilantin, which is anti-seizure medicine, and send her out and saying you should follow up with your primary care doctor. Sometimes these things happen. Um, so they're petrified, they're waiting by the phone, and they pick up the phone and they wait till eight o'clock when they know their office is open. This is a primary care practice who they've been seeing for four years. Husband calls, I'd like an appointment with my wife's primary care doctor. They said, well, the next available is in three weeks, which is unfortunately in Boston where I'm from, not atypical. And they said, well, she said, we don't understand, we've just in the ear, this is really important. Um, I need to see her today. Well, you could see a random schmo who you've never met before tomorrow. They said, you don't understand. This is the most serious thing that's ever happened to my wife. If I can't see her doctor today, what's the point of having a primary care doctor? Please explain it to her. Uh, and, and the secretary was being obstructionist, you know, because often I think, unfortunately, we have this attitude, the job of the front desk is to protect the doctor, you know, because the patient's the enemy. Um, and uh, but, so finally they got her, convinced her, well, please ask the doctor. I'm sure she'll know. So they wait by the phone. She says, well, tell me the story again. She writes it down. Wait by the phone. Say, wait for an hour. Waiting by the phone. Imagine, you know, how that feels. And then an hour later, they call back. And the secretary says, well, I finally got a hold of her story. She's really busy. And I told her the story. And here's what she said. She said, well, it sounds like you had the right tests and are on the right medication. There's no medical need for me to see her right now. Why don't you make an appointment in a week? We can check the dilantin level and go from there. Right? So now, None of those statements are false. They're all true statements. But she misses the point, right? This lady had a need. 
She needed to see a doctor. That's what we're here for, right? She had a thousand questions. What could this be? Should I quit my job? What should I tell my kids? Who's the best neurologist in town? Um, and more to the point, she wanted to know that someone was on the watch. So if something bad were to happen the next day, they had someone to call, right? They were petrified. And so I think we have completely missed the boat in healthcare um, and have turned this crazy system we have um, away from what the value we create, which is actually taking care of patients. So we start over from scratch. We said, blow up the system, little incremental changes, giving people a little buttons, hi, may I help you, are not going to fix the problem. We need to rebuild the culture, right? And this is the key. It's not about process. It's not about technology. It's about building culture. And I think it's really hard to change culture, so we're going to actually build it from scratch. And it's about hiring the right people, rewarding the right things, and building the right process to allow them to do the right thing. And happy to talk more about that later. Thank you. Kurt? Thank you, Liz. Uh, I'm Kurt Newman. Uh, I'm the president and CEO of uh, Children's National Medical Center, which is a large uh, 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 pediatric hospital in Washington, D.C. Now, I haven't always been a, a president and CEO. In fact, most of my career, I was a pediatric surgeon for about 28 years. So why would I want to uh, then become president and CEO of the hospital uh, I was in? Uh, I had the idea. Uh, and we're a nonprofit that acts like a nonprofit. Uh, that we uh, wanted to uh, sort of turn where, we, where our organization had been going uh, upside down, if you will. And it speaks to what my uh, colleagues here said. I had the feeling that our organization was uh, built to really serve the business needs, but it, what I wanted to do was get the patient and family back at the center, at the core value of what we do, the children at the core uh, center. So we um, uh, have set about doing that. And so we've created uh, a health system for kids, just like there's health systems for adults. Intermountain uh, is a great example. Partners is another great example. But we wanted to focus completely 100% on children. And we stand up for children. We're in Washington, D.C. We wanted to be the uh, children's hospital that was speaking for, for kids. We wanted to integrate the care with our primary care, our specialty care, our hospital, uh, so that uh, anyone in our organization would have the focus on the, on the child. Anything we did, it was uh, the child and family were going to be at the focus of that. So I think that speaks uh, uh, to dignity and uh, the value that you mentioned, Liz, of that innate value. Uh, that we have. In our society, sadly, uh, we're not paying enough attention to children. Uh, most things are focused on adult care. Uh, the ACA was uh, primarily about adult care. Uh, most of the things we uh, do, where we spend the money, where our research goes to, uh, goes to um, the adult, adult side of things. So I think, uh, and it's our effort and our uh, uh, focus uh, to really uh, get people focused, whether it's policy, reimbursement, uh, whatever the issue is on, on our children, because there's no smarter investment and there's no more necessary investment if we're gonna succeed as a society. So that's what dignity uh, and building a system around dignity means to me. Thank you. And last but not least, Peter. Hi, everyone. My name is Peter Drobak. Uh, I work with a group called Partners in Health, which is a, a Boston-based and Harvard-affiliated health and social justice organization. Uh, and I've lived and worked uh, for the better part of the last decade in a little village in rural Rwanda uh, and dividing my time between there and a big teaching hospital in Boston, which has been uh, quite an experience. And, and what we try to do is use healthcare as an entry point to break cycles of poverty and disease in some of the poorest communities uh, in the world, uh, both in the U.S. And, and certainly all over the world. And because so many of the communities that we work with are communities that have been riven by violence, division, exclusion, um, uh, discrimination, etc. We think a lot about dignity um, uh, as, uh, as a sort of a central approach to what we do in, in, in building effective health systems. Um, so much so that we've changed the word dignity into a verb. There already is a verb called dignified. We call it dignification um, uh, as actually one of the approaches that we use when, uh, when we enter a community. Uh, and I just want to give one quick example of, a, uh, of one of the sites where we work in, in, in Rwanda that I'm uh, particularly proud of. It's called Butaro. It's one of the most beautiful hospitals anywhere in the world and one of the most beautiful places anywhere in the world. Uh, and I think that that hospital is, uh, is an example of dignification in, uh, in, in, in probably about four different ways. The location, 
uh, the, the design itself, the process of creating it, and then the actual care delivery. Um, so this hospital is situated on the top of a mountain in a place that used to be uh, a military camp uh, and, and was a central battleground in the war that ended the 1994 genocide that took the lives of, of, of over a million people in just 100 days in 1994. And um, for the 20 years hence remained uh, one of the most underdeveloped parts of the country, the last to benefit th from the fruits of, uh, a, a, of the growth that was happening in Rwanda and was still a place where there were a lot of families and communities who felt excluded and felt left behind. And that was a central uh, reason that we were asked to go there. So simply the act of placing a hospital in one of these last mile communities that had been um, uh, uh, you know, marginalized for so long, I think made a powerful statement about equity, that we're gonna try to build one of the best hospitals in the country in this place. Second, the design itself, and we'll talk more about this on a, in a session tomorrow morning for those who are interested on buildings that heal, uh, but the building and the grounds were designed to not, first of all, be beautiful uh, and accessible. And, and we've found over the years that doing things as simple as you know, nice landscaping and, and having covered verandas and, uh, and flowers and trees creates a space that makes people feel proud of and makes a statement that everybody who comes here is worth something. Uh, and I think we took that to a much higher level in Butaro Hospital as well, where the design is uh, focuses on um, smart ventilation strategies to keep people healthy when they're in the hospital, but also provides a really welcoming, calming, tranquil experience as well. Third is the building process. Not getting too much into it here, it was a community-led kind of participatory approach and the hospital was built by the local community. Uh, we had a sort of an affirmative action uh, policy where social workers did most of the hiring uh, and they would hire people from marginalized communities like pygmy communities, hire um, uh, you know, uh, older adolescent, age, age orphans, uh, uh, you know, women who were, uh, who were leading households, et cetera. And every brick and every door and every window was made on site and it created thousands and thousands of jobs, good paying jobs with health insurance, and also created a sense of ownership in the community for this thing. And, uh, and then finally, the process of care delivery itself. And the hospital's not an island, it's part of a system, a healthcare delivery system that reaches all the way out into communities where every village has three community health workers who are their linkages to the health system. Many folks there are, are really accessing formal healthcare, modern medical care for the first time ever. Uh, and that's an intimidating thing. And so to have uh, an, an accompaniateur and a guide and someone that they trust from their community to help them navigate that has been really important. So the last thing to point out is that of those four things, the first three came before you even get to the interaction with the healthcare system, um, to the patient and provider meeting. Uh, and, and I think it just speaks to the fact that uh, with smart design that puts dignity at the center, you can do a lot. We found that health outcomes improved dramatically in those communities before the hospital opened its doors uh, because people were accessing basic primary health care, because people had jobs and they were reinvesting their money and putting their kids in school, et cetera. Uh, and, and so, um, uh, dignity is not only the, the right thing to do, but I think it's actually a really smart approach from a public health standpoint as well. Thank you. Um, I'm struck that as I'm hearing each of your stories, one of the themes that does seem to be continuous is this idea of human exchanges versus the transactional that you brought up, and this idea of relationships. And when we think of systems, we often think of them as almost anonymous things. They're like these amorphous structures that are big, and it's meant for organizing the way things operate in the world. But a lot of how you guys are talking about how you're able to put dignity at the center is about the relationships with the people within the healthcare system. And so I'm curious from your leadership positions, how do you sell that idea? How do you build the culture of dignity within this place? How do you set up the relationships so that everyone from you on down to the receptionist um, is channeling that idea of dignity and the way in which they're relating to people? You know, I could start with one thing. because um, I know that there's a lot more. So this is a deep one. It has to do with design. Uh, served on the IOM Committee on Quality of Healthcare in America, we published two reports, there is human, then something called Crossing the Quality Chasm, which you may have seen, which was the Institute of Medicine's prescription for reform of the healthcare system. To my knowledge, it was the first document that talked about patient-centered care. Uh, the idea actually came from Don Berwick, but here's what we meant. It's kind of morphed since then. So many places you visit, and I, it's valuable. I mean, I don't mean to denigrate it. It's the idea that you put patients on your teams, but, but it went a level deeper. Turns out that most patients experience the healthcare delivery system. Well, maybe we shouldn't call it healthcare delivery. Maybe we should call it the disease treatment system, more accurately. They experience it around a need. And that need usually takes the form of a health challenge or a disease. 
imagine that you organized a system not around the technology, not around the building, especially not around the physicians, which is a very common one. Um, imagine that you organized it around the way the patient experienced care so that they didn't have to pinball from one specialist to another on their own cognizance, sort of, but it was organized. We used to call it continuum of care. It's a core idea, the core idea, arguably, in quality improvement theory. We call them processes of care. You organize literally everything around it. As a continuum from before the thing starts, um, wonderful prevention opportunities through the entire encounter in an outpatient setting, through perhaps an inpatient setting, uh, till it's finally resolved one way or another. Uh, and with that structural piece, it fundamentally changes the way that people experience care. It allows the relationships to play through in a way. Not that you don't have other work, which I know you guys will cover, but just one idea mm -hmm. about how you organize. So I think we take very seriously the, the idea of empathy that, that you hit right on the head. If what we're doing different is really rebuilding the health system on the basis of relationships and not about transactions, if you want to do that, you need to build the right sort of relationships. And so we, our practice is we start from scratch. We hire everyone from the ground up uh, because I think you need to, f because, and we hire people with only one thing in mind, the, the, which is empathy, right? Because I don't think I can teach empathy to people, but I can certainly find people with empathy. And often you find them outside of healthcare, to be quite honest, right? Because we've squeezed it out of people who might have come in. It's really sad. You see, uh, I, I see you know, people going, I'm a pre-med advisor at Harvard, and you see kids who are work there asses off to try and get into medical school, and they have lots of empathy. And you see them coming out the other end of the funnel after four years of medical school and three years doing residency somewhere in the slave pits, and we've squeezed it out. Very few people come out without it having squeezed out of them, unfortunately. So, so we need to hire people with empathy, and we look for it. We look for it in our doctors, and if we don't find it, we fire them, right? You can be fired in our practice for not having empathy, right? We look for it, and we do, and the, you know, we can have a long conversation how you find it, I think it's really, really important. And, and just uh, why is relationship important? Um, another quick story, if you don't mind. So we had a patient who came into one of our practices in Atlantic City, and she was, um, uh, and by the way, so one of the key parts of our practice, we give everyone community health workers. We think that if getting people from the community, speak the language of the people they serve, if it works in Rwanda, it certainly work here in the US, right? So we have four health coaches, we call them, per doctors. So we have eight in a practice of two doctors. And their job is to make relationships with patients, help them with all the blocking and tackling of trying to do healthcare, be their advocate. So we had a patient, her, her name was uh, Joan, and I met her for the first time, and she, she was what I call a hot mess. She comes in, her hair is disheveled, her blood sugar's out of control, her diabetes, her hypertension's out of control, not taking her medications, not going to work. Um, and we sort of put on the program, give her a health coach, and go about our business. And I end up leaving the practice, and six months later, I come back to visit, and uh, Dr. Neal, one of the other docs, he said, remember that lady we met the first time, you know, Joan, the hot mess? I was like, yeah, I want you to meet her. She's back for a visit. So I come in, I see her, and it's a new person. Hair was combed, she had some makeup on, her blood sugar was under control, blood pressure under control, taking her meds, back to work, no ER visits. And so I think, you know, you look great. You know, do you remember me? She said, oh, of course, doctor. I said, you look great, congratulations. I said, can you tell me what have we done to help you, right? And, and we make huge investments in new IT systems and new guidelines and new, you know, all that stuff. She didn't say any of that. She didn't say that the building is pretty, which it is, and designed all that. She said, well, actually, doc, it's really simple is this health coach you gave me cared about me. She taught me to care about myself, and I didn't want to let either of us down, right? It's almost that simple, right? If we can rebuild healthcare on the basis of relationships like that, we fix healthcare. Um, unfortunately, there are so many forces in the current system that go against that, which is why you have to do all the other stuff. Well, I, I think as a, a, a leader that, uh, of an organization, that's your responsibility to build the culture that you are, are talking about. And so uh, I think it goes to uh, how you model the behavior. And, uh, uh, and in, in my case, uh, being a, a physician, uh, it starts with that. It starts going to, uh, by going to see patients and watching the, how the teams are performing, asking uh, members of the team what's going on, being sure to uh, uh, treat people uh, uh, fairly, whether they're the uh, gentleman who's uh, cleaning the room who's as important to safety as the cardiac surgeon. And I think as you do that and you stay focused, in our case, on the child and the family, uh, th there's a, a ripple effect. 
and it builds that respect within the team and the respect for the, the, the families and the, and the children. I think it goes to uh, things like having families, uh, in, in our case, uh, uh, parents on our board uh, that, uh, you know, from the top all the way to the bottom, we're focused on w what we're doing for the uh, kids and families, what we're doing for the community, and uh, it's asking and listening. It's uh, making rounds and, you know, how can we do things better? How can we uh, improve things? My first day, I, I rode the uh, shuttle buses with the em employees and was asking them, what can we do better? A nurse said, Dr. Newman, you need to have a, we need to have a pharmacy uh, uh, for the patients in the hospital that they can get their medications before they go home. And next week, we're gonna open a pharmacy. You can't imagine the impact that has on, on the employees in the, uh, in terms of, and the possibilities around safety and improvement in sin care. Uh, we've built, uh, uh, to Brent's point, uh, we've looked at these systems of care. Why, why does a child with diabetes need to go see the ophthalmologist in one clinic or the endocrinologist in another clinic or the psychologist or the nutritionist? We thought, why don't we bring it all together? And philanthropists love this kind of thing. So we built a multidisciplinary uh, diabetes clinic that's got a kitchen in it where we can teach uh, kids to, uh, and families how to eat and what's good about nutrition. It's got a gym in it, and all the doctors come there, and the kids and families get everything they need in one, in, in one stop. So it's really thinking uh, about uh, things uh, through the lens of the patient and family. It's about uh, creating rounds where families are on the rounds and they can understand what's going on with, uh, uh, with their child. It's being respectful uh, of pain and suffering. It's, being, uh, it's, it's thinking about uh, uh, children uh, who might die and uh, making sure that the experience while they're uh, in your care is meaningful because that family is going to live with that uh, forever. So it's, uh, uh, as leaders, we need to, uh, we need to create that, that culture, and we need to live it. Cool. Well, there's so much to add. This is all, all really well said, and we've been, we've been trying to learn from, from Intermountain Healthcare and, and Don Berwick and IHI for a lot of years, so I couldn't agree with all of this anymore. Uh, maybe one thing to add uh, from our experience that I think has been really important is uh, sort of the notion of, of uh, proximity uh, and integration with the, with the community. Uh, we find it really important in a place like Rwanda that all the decisions about how healthcare is going to be delivered are not made in boardrooms in the capital city by people in suits and shiny shoes like us, uh, but in fact are made by folks in the community uh, and, and, and we I dress up well. Um, so, um, so we instead root ourselves in the community, and that's why we live in a village. Our CFO lives in a little village in a small house uh, on a dirt road, uh, you know, surrounded by the communities that we're working with and serving. And when we first came in 2004, um, the first mandate was to introduce HIV treatment in these rural communities that had never seen it before. And so we got together with these community HIV associations, people who had banded together to support one another and advocate for their, for their right to treatment, uh, and we used them as sort of our eyes and ears to understand the problems, and uh, and uh, the healthiest amongst them were the first 30 people that we hired to be community health workers and accompaniateurs, and um, and that sort of we've built from there. You know, there's a team of about 5,000 people that I that I oversee in Rwanda, and 99% of them are, are rural poor. Um, a lot of them community health workers and others, and they keep us honest um, and help make sure that we're accountable um, to to the folks that we're trying to serve. Maybe building on that last point and, and tying back to something that you said, Brent, around the continuum of care, I think normally when we think of health care, we think very much within the specific environments of the hospital or the clinic facility. And, and you're talking about living in the community, which offers up a whole bunch of other different types of interactions. And I would imagine that the personal health coach is doing the same thing as well. So how do you set up your system to make those connections outside, to establish a continuum of care that might fall outside of what we have traditionally defined as what a healthcare system should be doing, since that seems central to the way in which several of you have kind of described this idea of making sure that dignity happens? We simply think that our job is to help our patients with all of their health. Not, our job is not to be a primary care practice and turn our brain off when people leave our door. Right? Our job is there. we are entrusted with their health, and we need to help them do the things that we can do, but then help them navigate the rest of this crazy sort of non-system as well. So I think a lot of it is just how you perceive what your role is. Reframing. Reframing completely what the role is. And again, I think we've built all these structures around our needs and not the needs of our patients. You know, on a, a little bit bigger scale, uh, 
you need to, you need to understand your community and what they think their needs are. And in fact, that's uh, mandated these days uh, uh, for health systems is to, um, to question and listen and uh, understand what the community needs are. And you find some very, uh, uh, you know, new things uh, about what the community feels like you need to be doing in terms of the improvement of health care. And in Washington, D.C., uh, it's asthma, it's obesity, it's uh, uh, some of the things around uh, poverty that uh, influence health uh, because so many of the kids uh, are living in poverty and whether it's nutrition, obesity, whatever. So we uh, work with the school system and run the school uh, uh, health program, for example, and want to bring, uh, uh, although you think of us as a hospital, uh, you know, we're looking at the primary care, which we uh, provide. Uh, we're looking at the school health so that we can impact those issues that are important uh, uh, to the, the family in a, in a holistic way. We've got to partner with other organizations. We've got to partner in the community. Um, and we've got to look at mental health, an area that uh, most hospitals uh, really don't, don't pay much attention to. So those are the kinds of things that uh, you learn if you're, you're uh, it's almost really uh, getting back to being humble and having a humility about uh, respecting uh, the, the dignity of not only the, the patient, uh, but the community. So I think that the, when you build that into your, your culture, then wonderful things will happen. Some useful, potentially useful statistic, Liz. Uh, this is Mike McGinnis's work, was the last person in this chain of evidence. About 40% of your health depends on your own behaviors. About 30%, the joke is how wise you are in selecting your parents, it's genetics. Um, we don't have anything really to offer at that level yet. It's starting to develop. Uh, a little over 20% is public health. Um, social and um, physical environment is the best way to say it, probably. At best, the disease treatment system is about 10%. If I get really nasty, rigorous, put on my green visor and my sharp pencil, maybe 5% of how long or how well someone will live depends on care delivery. Um, Beautiful little study. I don't know if they ever published it. Uh, shared with me by John Nelson, then president of the AMA, then at the AMA. Behavioral challenges to health. Um, number one is still tobacco. Uh, number two uh, was alcohol and other recreational drugs. An amazing toll from alcohol in this country. Truly amazing toll. More deaths from acute alcohol poisoning, usually in 20-somethings, than from accidental firearm deaths, uh, for example. Uh, Number three is obesity. That's probably moving into number two. Number four is uh, sexually transmitted disease, including AIDS. Number five is, I don't know how best to say it, unwed teenage pregnancy. Teenagers are perfectly capable of bearing healthy children. It's the lack of a social support network for the new family. Most of the harm happening in the life of the neonate. Number six is uh, accidents, violence, and suicide, particularly among young men. Now, those factors, there are four things that determine them. The number one thing is education level. So this is not a set of diseases that you suffer from or that I suffer from. It's a disease of the poor. Uh, it describes mostly the underclass. There's a direct association with education level. There's a body of literature that strongly suggests that you get more health effect by investing in general education. Creating more high school graduates and more college graduates has a bigger health effect than investing the same money in care delivery, just in passing. Uh, education level, of course, not just healthy behaviors, also ties directly to your income level, very significant ways, and that ties to access to insurance, effective use of the health system as it exists, you see. And you get those four together, and they're almost impossible to pick apart. They come as a set. So you see what, what I mean? can you do? I mean, you're a health care well, provider, so... <laughs> say what you do. I, I am personally convinced that this is not well-suited for the health care delivery system for the disease treatment system, we partner. Uh, within Intermountain, we call it Live Well. We do it starting with our own employees, but then reaching out to communities, it's community planning. It's partnering with uh, religious organizations, with schools, other community organizations, local governments, and working on health as opposed to disease treatment. Now, having said that, people massively value having someone there when lives are on the line and they're feeling challenged. It's only 5%, but they still really value it. So you need to do that well, too. But I predict that you're going to see a much higher integration with other organizations. You can't really replace the education in a doctor's office. 
the educational component, you see? You can partner and help build that. I think that the health system can lead it. So we're trying to invest fairly heavily in coordinating it, leading it, supplying materials to those other groups, but the real effect arm where you can really get some leverage is not inside a physician's office or inside a hospital. It's out in the larger community. So Peter, I'm, I'm curious because in the context that you're working in, very clearly a lot of the issues that we're talking about that are outside of healthcare are happening. And you guys have been able to do some pretty interesting things there. And so I'm curious like how what you've heard from people who are operating more in a domestic context relates or doesn't to what you're finding you have to do in Rwanda. Yeah, I mean, the dynamics are all the same. Things are a little bit different there. And if anything, the sort of social determinants of health or disease, as, as, as they're called, are even more prominent or, or prevalent there. I guess one difference is that, uh, you know, all the gentlemen here are pioneers in trying to help fix a broken disease treatment system, as Brent called it. Um, there wasn't really a health system in Rwanda because it was destroyed. Um, and we're sort of building something together from scratch. It's a public health system. So we're trying to be a little bit smarter uh, and a little bit broader in, uh, in our approach to doing so. Um, and certainly one part of that means using health as an entry point, but understanding that there are all kinds of other barriers to good health. And it's not just geographic and financial barriers to actual medical care, although that, those are big ones, uh, but also uh, food insecurity and lack of access to education and economic insecurity that comes from lack of jobs. Um, all of those kinds of things, you know, basic housing standards, um, you know, leaky roofs cause disease when kids sleep in the mud, all those kinds of things as well. And so we've tried to build some systems that address those things as well. And a, and a provider in uh, one of the hospitals that we support can write a prescription for food or can write a prescription for a tin sheet for your house um, or other kinds of supports as well. And some of those things have also been um, sort of taken up by the government of Rwanda more broadly uh, that, um, that nutritional interventions, for example, can be part of the HIV care delivery system. You know, there was a patient of ours in Haiti years and years ago who's now an activist who famously said that, um, you know, that taking your antiretroviral drugs uh, without food is like washing your hands and drying them in the dirt. You can't keep them down. You're not going to ever get better um, unless you're solving these problems. And um, so we're trying to take a broader approach. Um, and part of that means, as again, Brent said, uh, is building partnerships. Um, for us, you know, my boss, Paul Farmer, always says we called ourselves Partners in Health for a reason because we can't do it alone. <laughs> We partner with governments, we partner with communities, we partner with churches and civil society organizations, we partner with a lot of other organizations that are a lot better at us at clean water and education and all the other things that, um, that we have less experience with and, and, and we, we try to be a thought leader and help pull things together. Um, I think that's a big part of it. What we've seen in Rwanda is that the, the Minister of Health is the leader of what they call in the government the social cluster. And so they sit the health and the education and the gender and the youth uh, and a couple of other ministries all together and say you guys got to work together. And again, sort of health is the entry point, but let's make sure you guys can see how all the pieces fit together uh, for broader sort of uh, health, wellness, economic development, et cetera. So in some ways, actually, it's interesting. Is I think it's actually in some ways easier to do what you're doing in Rwanda than it is in the U.S. Yeah. Because we have all these stupid rules, right. which um, <laughs> actually right. prevent us from doing very normal things. So the, the, about prescriptions for food, Jack Geiger, who some of you may know, who was one of the people who started community health centers, he tells a great story of the first community health center in rural Mississippi in the Delta, where lots of kids were hungry. And so he was given a pharmacy budget. And he decided, well, out of the pharmacy budget, instead of that, he gave some a pharmacy budget to the local grocery store and would be writing prescriptions for food. And you would go to the grocery store and fill it. And somewhere, word trickled back to Washington. And they went ballistic. And they sent a team of you know guys with suits and shiny shoes down to the Mississippi Delta to confront Dr. Geiger about this and said, you can't be pre prescribing food. Um, and he said, well, last I checked, the treatment for malnutrition <laughs> was food. <laughs> Seems silly to prescribe anything else. Um, but again, there are all sorts of rules. In many states, uh, if you're working on Medicaid, you can't, you can't get paid for a mental health visit on the same day as a physical health visit. It's ridiculous, right, that we, we want to integrate these two things, take, make people come back. There are, you know, we, we've gotten into awful lots of trouble for doing things which make tons of sense, but because people are protecting their turf and because they're looking out for themselves and not at all the patients. So in some ways, I think um, that's part of the problem. Well, I would uh, disagree a little bit yeah. because I think what he's doing without resources, I mean, we've got so many resources in this country. And it's just a matter of leadership. And people like you are, are leading and we're making change. And Brent uh, uh, mentioned it. Uh, a, an organization like Intermountain Health can be the catalyst uh, to change that community. Uh, they're probably one of the biggest employers. 
uh, they're probably, they affects, what did you say, 60% of the uh, people are somehow uh, involved with the health system. In our, our world, 80% of the kids in Washington, D.C., uh, uh, we take care of in some way. Uh, we're involved with the school system now. We can, ta we can make dents in asthma, mental health. Uh, it's just really having the will and, uh, and the focus uh, to make change because the resources are there, and it's just up, up to us to advocate, to lead, and use these wisely. It's interesting. I do think that um, some of the challenge might be in how you define what success is. A lot of the things that we've talked about so far in terms of measuring are not the things where you measure to, like disease burden, basically, which is what we understand of what is success. Um, and I, I want to turn it over to people to be able to ask questions, but maybe if I could get a couple comments about, like, so how do you measure when your system is doing something that creates dignity, that it's addressing all of these other things, but it may not fall under what the statistics we recognize as good health? So, you know, that's a special area for me. Um, the first thing I'd say is we count our successes in lives. The lives defined broadly. We count our successes in lives. Uh, the easiest is mortality rates, where I can document more than 1,000 lives per year in the Intermountain system, far overshadowed by reductions in suffering, uh, restoration of function. Um, second part of our mission is to keep health care affordable. We actually define our mission as the best medical result at the lowest necessary cost. If it's burdening the community too heavily, um, it, either people won't be able to afford those services or it'll pull too many resources out of other critical areas. So that's actually part of our mission, is to keep it cheap. In a quality improvement setting, when you talk about that continuum, the jargon is move upstream. So quality improvement takes the idea of prevention, preventive medicine, and generalizes it. Um, so this last year, um, we took out, well, our first six big projects of about 20, $39 million of cost. The biggest single contributor was uh, explicit indications for cardiac cath procedures, stenting, and electrophysiology. We were already one of the best in the nation. We just dropped it by more than 20% and showed that it didn't affect our patient outcomes. Um, I can document about $400 million in structural cost shifts for the Intermountain system. We have a goal called CPI plus one. I tried to convince our CFO to do it as GDP minus two. But we're actually, our rate increases for the real people in our community, for the actual amount they pay for the healthcare system needed to be CPI plus 1% year over year annual increase. Um, and we hit it, so, uh, mostly by extracting so, so waste. I think what you guys are doing is great, but I think it's not nearly aggressive enough. We know that 30% of what we do is waste. It's over 50. Yeah, right. So, 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 so holding ourselves to keeping inflation down to 1% seems silly. We need to drop healthcare costs down. And we and some other people have been able to you know, lock hospitalizations down by 40%. ER visits down in half, total spend down by 12 to 15% in one year, one year, right? That's very disruptive, right? We're going to close hospital beds. We're going to put cardiologists out of work. But I think there is an obscene amount of money, and it ought to be spent on other things than healthcare if, if we want to do it. So I think this, we feel happy we've knocked inflation to CPI plus one. That's not good enough. Come, come run the whole health system for a while. <laughs> but it's, it's not really a you get a few of these and then scale. No, it's not, I don't think it is. You know, I think it's, um, I, I, again, it's easy for me to do because I'm not employing all these people. And, and it's good. I think we need both sides of it. But I think we need to hold our health system to a much higher account than we are right now. And it's clear that it could be much, much yes. better, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, okay. I, I think uh, your, your, um, your question's important. And there's, uh, I think there's, uh, you need to measure things, uh, whether it's uh, mortality or safety, uh, the patient experience, uh, the impact on the, uh, the community, on the, uh, you know, what, what's the immunization rate, what's uh, uh, the emergency visits for asthma in the community. Uh, and, and if you're going to be a leading organization, you want to you do that. But another way is just the anecdotal. I was struck by the story you told. Uh, and, you know, as a leader, you want to stay... Um, uh, in touch with those stories and, and how are the employees feeling about uh, uh, working in your organization and, and how are the patients and, and, and families uh, uh, thinking about it. And I, I uh, uh, you know, want to understand those, listen to them, uh, celebrate those, but uh, we had one a, a couple of weeks ago, um, a, a woman, uh, I came to the 
a hospital through the, um, uh, she wanted to revisit the hospital. She uh, had had twins. Uh, one uh, had, uh, uh, had a lot of uh, significant medical issues and, be and was brain dead. And, she, and the family had uh, donated the organs. Uh, that had happened a year before. Uh, she wanted to come back through the UNOS, the organ uh, uh, donation uh, group, uh, to visit the hospital. And she wanted to go uh, to the operating room where her baby had been when they uh, took the organs. We'd never had that request before. The uh, operating room staff was uh, really afraid, uh, you know, that uh, what was going to happen with uh, this mother. But she wanted to see uh, where her uh, child was um, in those last moments and wanted to meet the staff. And we set this all up, and it was unbelievable. Uh, the, um, uh, just the, the spirit with which uh, the staff received her, showed her uh, where her uh, child had been, and her... Uh, uh, one of her big uh, contributions was she asked the staff, well, how do you feel about this when this happens? Nobody had ever asked the staff that, and it uncovered all sorts of, it's, it was almost the, the stress and anxiety uh, that was put on these uh, professional nurses and, and doctors uh, that were taking care, and you, know, you think of them as these hardened uh, uh, individuals are just doing their job. Uh, to save other lives, uh, but it was really, really intense, and it opened up so many things. So that's, I think, when you have those things go on, that's when you're really uh, making a difference. That's when you're really um, uh, treating people with dignity. It's interesting, because if I were to link sort of what's been said, it's this combination of the quantitative and the qualitative, mm -hmm. that maybe we rely a lot on the quant, but a lot of what you guys have shared are really these stories that I think help me and hopefully help you guys understand what's happening on the inner workings of your system so much better. Um, I was going to open it up to questions, so there is a mic over there, um, and if you would just sort of make your way over to there and maybe tell us your name um, yeah, and uh, uh, what sorry. kind of organization you're with. Yeah. Um, before you tell your question. Yeah, uh, my name's Cameron, I'm from Canada. I do uh, work in addiction policy for a pharmaceutical company, but it's one with a heart, which is good because otherwise I'd be gone three years ago. Um, <laughs> one, but as you, you all know, um, when it comes to addictive patients, there's nobody that suffers probably more of a lack of dignity than them. And it's in terms of even how some of the physicians or what have you, or even lay people um, use terms like, oh, you've got a dirty urine or um, you are an addict versus a patient, or you know, we penalize people who are in recovery. We say things like, well, why can't you just get over it? But if that person had systemic lupus, we wouldn't be saying those same things. Um, and one of the things that we've seen up in Canada quite regularly as the crisis in opioid addiction has risen very significantly is um, many doctors will actually, one day a patient goes in and they will say, I'd like you know, more fentanyl or what have you and they go in on a Tuesday and on a Thursday they come back and they say you know what doctor here's the problem I actually think that that car accident I had I'm now actually addicted to the pain meds and then the doctor says right okay so you can get leave my practice right now because I don't treat people like you when in the first place the doctor was you know f officially or unofficially the dealer and I can't think of a, a worse way for a patient to experience a lack of dignity than to have a physician um, say that they are essentially no longer welcome. So I'm just kind of trying to get my head around what can be done maybe even in the curriculum of medical schools to get this concept of dignity. Because it's fine to, and I take your point, um, I can't remember your name in the middle, um, I, it's fine to fire a, a physician for, for acting undignified or treating a patient bad. But if you're an addicted patient, you're likely lost and gone to the streets or dead or what have you. So how do we get there? before it even transpires? How do we in, instill the dignity at the school level in the curriculum so that these kind of things are innate in part of the training, the bedside manner and all that kind of stuff? Thanks. I've got one idea for you. I'm certainly not the complete idea. I believe that one of the reasons that many of those physicians respond that way is they don't have anything that they perceive that they can offer. And it's giving them a set of tools or approaches, um, some of its ideas, some of its systems, some of it's just support. So that when somebody says something like that, they say, we can help you. And here's how we can do it. And I think it changes their response, just as an idea. There's another aspect to it, and maybe it's a little broader than just the addicted patients, but uh, it, it, the way I think of it is uh, around mental health and behavioral issues. There's such a stigma 
that uh, gets in the way of really doing the right thing. Uh, and uh, in our world, um, it's, you know, 20% of kids will have some sort of mental health behavioral issue, whether it's depression, eating disorder, uh, autism, uh, ADHD. Uh, but we're not uh, tackling that. And uh, it, most uh, kids, it, it'll be eight years before they get to treatment when it's diagnosed, and many go undiagnosed. So it's, uh, uh, I don't know what the situation is in Canada, but in the United States, it's just, uh, uh, you know, uh, here we are with all of these resources, and we're not uh, doing enough research. We're not training enough uh, mental health providers. Uh, we don't have the uh, uh, sort of teams that uh, we need to have or the tools uh, to take care of it. So some of that is uh, our responsibility to shine the light on it and advocate and do like, like, like you're doing and try and develop uh, uh, systems that are responsive. Can I just give you an example? We have a woman in our system named uh, Brenda Reese Brennan. Uh, the trigger for her work was a pediatrician who had what he labeled problem families. Uh, he usually thought it was family pathology. Um, it was centered around the child who came into his practice and he thought it was mental health issues. Um, and he had very little to offer. Brenda came up with a system for how you dealt with that. It included increasing detection rates quite dramatically. She trained everybody in the whole clinic, not just the physicians and the nurses, but the receptionist. Mm -hmm. uh, quick signs for identifying the problem. A series of validated instruments for then uh, increasing not just your sensitivity, but your specificity to know what it was. Then an explicit treatment regimen that was associated with dramatic increases in detection, demonstrated better patient outcomes. And the interesting thing is, is once again, this is kind of expected in quality improvement, a drop in total health care costs associated with that thing. Now, my problem is I think about that, it was a real success, kind of along the way that you were talking about. My problem is it doesn't go near far enough. So it's, Jim Reinerson said it. He said it's being the real cream of the crap. <laughs> um, you see, and you make it much better, and then you realize what it ought to be or it could be, and then it's just keep pushing the stone up the hill. Better has no limit. That's the next question. Um, wonderful panel, thank you. Very um, powerful stories. Um, the question I'm, I just directed toward Dr. James, um, I was really um, glad that you used the word reduction in suffering, um, and I think that that's a term that we've sort of lost in health care systems or sick care systems, and coming off of just... Uh, inpatient ward month, we're teaching residents, we have some reflection rounds. Um, there's a lot of psychosocial, we see a lot of psychosocial suffering as well as physical suffering. And I'm wondering, how do you measure uh, reductions in suffering? Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of different measures that I, so I haven't explicitly addressed it, so I won't give you a very precise answer. <laughs> um, what I would be looking for is a combination. Can I link it to a physical outcome, an externally observable outcome? would be one set of measures. And then secondarily, I'd be looking for some sort of uh, patient-generated measures. Yeah. And I would want to validate them. I would want to scientifically validate them so that I knew that I was using a reliable and valid measure. Um, it's a little bit of work. It's not that hard. You can do it. And then you systematically improve it over time. So, so we use a number of measures that we work with the folks at the Dartmouth Institute, so John Wasson and Jean Nelson and Elliot Fisher, which are validated, which are sort of patient-reported measures of how your health is. And I think that they're as important or maybe more important than the stuff we often measure, which is A1C and LDL and blood pressure, and which is sort of our point of view. Uh, but from a patient's point of view, maybe these suffering measures are really what our job is. Jean Nelson's one of the real leaders in the world Jean's in that, great. by the way. And, um, his is uh, that he calls it, uh, and I'll get it wrong, we use it actually inside our system too. And I want to say it's PGP, he calls it, um, uh, anyway, he's got a validated measure. Eugene's, Eugene Nelson's a good place to start. Yeah, you, between your comment and that question, that really was what I wanted to say. I mean, when you look at the gap between the passion and authenticity that all four of you brought to talking about the importance of respect and dignity, and then the measures you're going to go back and be held accountable for, it's great. I, 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 those answers were really satisfying to me, but I hope we can redouble our efforts. That's all. Hi there. My name is John Fox, and I work at Athena Health. Hi, Rashika. Good to see you. Um, so we're, we're in the business of connecting care with technologies and services across the continuum, uh, and that includes electronic medical records. 
And, uh, you know, we talk a lot at Athena about the, you know, developing the EMR so that it doesn't come between the provider and the patient um, and the, the provider can stay focused on care. But we know we haven't perfected that and no one has. Most providers hate their EMRs. I think most patients hate them maybe more than the providers. Uh, we've all had that experience of speaking to a doctor who's completely focused on a computer monitor in the corner instead of on you, which I think speaks to you know, lack of dignity. Um, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on how do we break through that? Um, we've heard a lot here about you know, the wonders of technology, but technology can get in the way of that sacred bond too. Yeah. One quick thought. Today's EMRs are not tomorrow's EMRs. And Athena Healthcare is actually a wonderful example of forging ahead into that next generation. Um, so very clearly we now have the design for a next generation of systems that will be substantially better. And you're working on it. I work on it a bit too. And so what, what I would watch say, this space. I, I would uh, uh, agree with that. But the, the work you're doing and, and that all of the uh, uh, systems are doing are on a mega level really improving care. I mean, safety is improving. Uh, we haven't had, an, since we built some uh, checks and balances into our system, haven't had adverse drug uh, effect in a long time. People's allergies get noted and prevented. Uh, the analytics that you do, uh, you find uh, all sorts of trends that you want to help your providers uh, get on. But I think it does go back to uh, that intimacy of the uh, doctor-nurse uh, uh, patient uh, relationship and using technology to enhance that, not to get into the way of that, and then design uh, the, the next generation of systems that, that promote that, that are not just trying to uh, take that and cram it into an information system, but use it to uh, enhance that, that, that bond, that relationship. So, so we, we've decided that the typical EMRs suck, including yours, no offense. <laughs> and, uh, and it's not your fault, right? It's because what you're trying to do is maximize billing and coding. Right, these things are by and large, at least in the primary care level, uh, systems that help you build level fours and not level threes. So they make you do all these bogus things about documenting reviews of systems you never did and collecting all this information that doesn't really matter um, in order to generate a higher billing code so that you can justify buying the EMR. And so what we decide to do is break out of that stupid system. So we don't bill fee for service. It's the wrong way to bill for primary care. We need to change the payment model so it, it matches with taking care of patients. Um, so we have a fixed sort of fee, make it really simple. And that allows us to build completely different systems which aren't focused on pointing and clicking and dots, but about telling people stories and connecting. Um, we call it a collaborative care platform where everyone, including the patient and their family and everyone on the team, can collaborate on data related to the patient. It's a right vision, I think. I think there are some of us around the country working on it, but it is the next generation. That can go in a lot of different directions, but we're almost out of time, so I want to give space for one more question. So, uh, hi, uh, Matt Winnie. I am uh, sp split my time these days between the American Medical Association in Chicago and the University of Colorado uh, in Denver. And I'm, one, of, one of the things we deal with at the AMA is the profound levels of dissatisfaction, uh, professional dissatisfaction. I expect, Rashika, you know, many physicians would love to work with you. But, m but most of us work in systems where we're mid-level employees, frankly. Uh, and we feel, you know, put upon. We, and I know this is a sob story for uh, that doesn't get a lot of, uh, doesn't resonate with with folks nationwide. But from within the physician community, uh, and and within the health provider community in general, I think there's a tremendous amount of dissatisfaction and disempowerment right now. And you you're in leadership positions. I think uh, it, it's wonderful to hear your stories. But I know you weren't always in leadership positions. Uh, your career paths have been interesting and have included time spent in mid-level management positions. And I'm wondering if you would say a few words about leading from the middle and, uh, and how we can take the leadership lessons that you can apply with a relative degree of ease once you're up here. And, uh, and, and tell us how we can help people apply those lessons when they're in here and they're feeling like they don't have control over the billing system. They can't change the EMR. They cannot change how they're paid, right? Uh, what, what, can, what can we help those doctors do, and nurses, and PAs, and so on? Well, I can start a, a little bit. Um, when I was uh, practicing surgery, uh, 
I mean, there were a lot of frustrations that you, that you outlined, but there was nothing more satisfying than taking care of a child or, or, or a family and working with a team and, and getting great outcomes. And um, by, by concentrating on that and then trying to build the micro systems around that and then looking for opportunities to partner or fundraise, that's a huge opportunity uh, to uh, develop resources. Looking for leadership uh, roles uh, to take that celebration of what you're doing with the patients to uh, broader audiences. It's true, if you stay within the system, you may not be able to uh, do that. But if you think differently, change the rules, uh, work outside, develop the resources, create uh, organizations like uh, Paul Farmer uh, uh, created, uh, you, the, the vistas open up. And, um, and then you just take that to the, 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 the next level. But you're always focused on that, uh, the, the, the patient and the family. One idea, or two, I guess. I really like this idea of focus on patients first. That's what drew most of us into healthcare. Um, it's a primary mission. It's a, what makes us happy. Um, the second, I really like Roger's classic text, Diffusion of Innovation. He's the guy who talked about early adopters. Uh, so I spent a lot of time at Intermountain, down in the guts of the system, right? Um, happily violating all the rules. <laughs> um, but what I would do is find an early adopter or two around a particular topic, something they were truly enthusiastic about. And my job was to make them successful. And I usually backed them up with data. Um, sometimes a little bit of resource. Didn't take much. And that usual cycle of feeling towards success. And then as they started to get successes, it was my job to um, make them superstars, to shine the lights on them, right? Nothing so locks them down in this as external credit in honest truth. And sure enough, then you'd have another group who kind of, I thought it was Tom Sawyer washing the fence. Next thing you know, you have other people who are looking over and saying, you know, you really ought to do it that way and say, let's give it a try in your practice. The next thing you know, you're solidly into your early majority, then the late majority. Some of these swung really fast. And then it was convincing because of the data it produced. I mean, the data were unassailable that you were producing far better clinical results and oh, by the way, the cost fell. You see, if it's not fun, it's not quality improvement. <laughs> uh, and frankly, can't count the people who told me it's what gave some joy back to their work. It's you know, that I'm natural gonna, outlet of creativity. I don't want to cut you off, I know we're almost no, out of time, fine. so I just want to quickly hear from these two guys because I think what they've done is that they've kind of worked in those middle rungs and gone out and um, been a part of organizations that are on the leading edge. So that leap, I think, might be interesting in reference to this question. Yeah, maybe if I can just build on what Brent said, because I've become a bit of a quality improvement nerd over the years as well. I mean, so when I'm seeing patients in Boston, um, which I was last week, the thing that frustrates me the most is all the paperwork and the bureaucracy and the crazy billing codes and the fact that I spend, you know, uh, eight hours out of a 10 hour day at a computer instead of um, at the bedside. And when I'm in Rwanda, what frustrates us and what frustrates all of our providers is having the knowledge and the skills and the passion to help a patient and not having the tools to do so. Uh, and so certainly one of the things we focus on is trying to bring those tools and capacitating the system because there's nothing more frustrating than not being able to have the medicine you need or get the x-ray you need or what what have you. Um, and so we're doing the best we can there, but obviously resources are limited and means are limited. And so it's also about being able to do better with what we've got. And what we've really found then has been a huge motivator has been building quality improvement systems into the work at all levels, arming people with data, uh, as, as Brent said, and letting everybody be part of the process of generating new ideas, of testing new ideas, of trying to make things a little bit better and then getting to see the results of your work. Uh, and so this kind of notion of bringing data, tons of data is produced in Rwanda. It's crazy, it's just like here, and it all just goes into reports somewhere and nobody ever looks at it. So trying to be smarter about the data that's being collected and making sure it's being fed back to the right people so they can see it, understand it, talk about it, dissect it, try to fix it a little bit has been, um, I think has been really meaningful for people. This is, I agree with all, all of this. I, th I think bear witness, I think we have a huge uh, opportunity as physicians to be taking care of real patients, be able to tell real stories. And our bearing witness is huge power 
which I think we underestimate. And you can do that no matter what organization you're in. Uh, number two is I think be subversive. I think find opportunities where you can, uh, you know, you can do pilots and you can break the rules a little bit, right? And I think uh, if no one ever breaks the rules, we'll never figure out that they're stupid rules to begin with. So um, I think the and then finally is you know at some point. When you get frustrated enough, you do what I did and vote with your feet and quit your job at Partners and, and just, just do it, right? And it's, it's very funny. Doctors are so risk averse. In some ways, we ought not to be. You, I, you can always get a job. Your family will not starve, <laughs> right? So, so if anyone has the ability to take some risks in their career, it's a doctor. But yet, somehow, we're, we're bred not to do that. I think that's a great final note. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I think the w one thing that's really interesting is we started off with this idea of dignity and talking about it more from the patient perspective, and now we come full circle and sort of also talking about the provider as a human being as well. And I think it's that exchange of human relationships that is super important. And I'm glad that there was this introduction of data towards the end, because I think that sometimes think people think of data as just numbers. Um, but I once heard somebody describe quite beautifully that um, data is actually numbers with a soul. And, um, you know, if you just look at the numbers and don't try and package it with any of the other stuff, yeah, it's just, it's just this plain old thing you can't go deeper with. But I think you guys have kind of talked about through your examples that you can bring something else to make them even stronger, more compelling. So I want to thank you guys for this conversation. I know there's so much more that can go, and I hope you guys will come and find them either here or later on and, and dive further into this topic. But I want to thank you for your attention and participation.